My name is Anthony O'Rourke, I'm head gardener at Down House, the home of Charles Darwin, and welcome to this virtual tour of our beautiful gardens today. This is the home that Charles Darwin shared with his wife Emma from the autumn of 1842 until his death in 1882, and it's where they raised their large family. Charles and Emma Darwin both came from very privileged backgrounds, and when they first came here to view the house, they were very, very unimpressed. At this stage in his career, he'd already garnered the reputation as a well-respected geologist. And when he came here, it was not the house that impressed him, but it was the landscape. It was here that he recognised it was where the London clay met the chalk of the North Kent Downs. This was incredibly important because it meant he was able to establish a viable, productive kitchen garden to feed the workers and his family. But also it meant that he could do his really important research Shortly after moving to Down House in 1842, the Darwins set about lowering the road at the front aspect of the property. In addition to this, they also built a six foot wall, because at this stage in his career, he was already a respected geologist and was very well known. And this would have given the privacy that the Darwin family so greatly appreciated. Now the spoil from the road was used to carry out landscaping within the garden, such as the mound here, which is currently ablaze with azaleas. These particular azaleas were Emma Darwin's favourite and are incredibly fragrant. The scent is really pervading the air at the moment. She would have had these planted throughout the garden so she could enjoy that beautiful fragrance at this time of the year. The gardens also contained rhododendrons donated by his good friend Joseph Hooker. Joseph Hooker was the director of the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew and he'd collected these plants on his expedition to the Himalaya. The day-to-day -day running of the garden was very much the responsibility of Charles's wife, Emma. She had a very informal style, and this is reflected in the very naturalistic planting here. And some of these plants include perennial cornflowers, lupins, and the pheasant's eye narcissus in the foreground there. Darwin really was the antithesis of the archetypal Victorian father, and his children later recall in their memoirs of a very warm and happy childhood and the stage for this would have been here on the veranda and this lawn. Darwin would have lay under the trees and listened to the buzzing of the bees in the lime trees overhead while his children played with perhaps a rabbit or a cat or a dog. And this warm family home was this very sort of domestic family setting of this period of incredible scientific endeavour and discovery. The gardens here have been lovingly restored by English heritage to reflect how they would have been when the Darwins lived here. Some of the planting, however, like this old veteran mulberry tree, is original, and the children recall climbing through its branches from the upstairs nursery down into the garden in order to play. The garden here and the surrounding countryside was Darwin's living landscape laboratory and formed the physical setting for all of Darwin's research. Take, for example, this experiment here on the lawn. This is one of the very first ecological studies ever carried out. Darwin concluded that in the absence of grazing, the coarser plants took over and choked out the weaker plants. And this led to a reduction in species number. In the 1850s, Darwin commissioned a local carpenter to build him a glass house in which he could grow carnivorous plants, orchids, and climbing plants for his botanical studies. The tropical section of this glass house would have been heated by coal, which was fed through an exterior hopper by, of course, the gardeners. This would have heated hot water pipes, which would have kept the temperature in here above 18 degrees, essential for growing tropical plants. Darwin was especially fascinated by a tiny little bog plant called Drosera, which grew in the local bogs at Keston. And he studied this plant and fed it various foodstuffs and was able to come to the conclusion that it was indeed what he called insectivorous. Today, of course, we use the term carnivorous because we know that plants can consume and digest various animals, um, not just insects, but some of them in the tropics have been known to eat mice and even rats. The vast majority of the world's orchids are what we call epiphytic, which means that they grow on the trunks of other plants. This enables them the evolutionary advantage of having access to light, access to pollinators and access to wind to disperse their seeds. One such orchid is the flamboyant cattleya orchid, 
which grows high up in the canopy in tropical rainforests of South America. One of the climbers that he studied was the bignonia plant, which he observed had tendrils which grew away from the light. He concluded that this was an evolutionary adaptation in helping the plant cling to its support. Darwin initially described the kitchen garden as a detestable slip of land, but he really did feel it would be productive. And it was here where they grew all of the vegetables which would have been used in the kitchen. But they also grow herbs, such as medicinal herbs and also culinary herbs, like this sweet sesame with its aromatic foliage, smelling of sort of sweet aniseed. Unlike today, vegetables from the Victorian kitchen garden would have been strictly seasonal only. But when they grew, they came as a glut, like this asparagus. Back in Darwin's day, these would have fed the family, but today they benefit our visitors. And these are going to the tea room. The kitchen garden is also home to plants like this cardoon, which although today is grown as an ornamental, back in the Victorian period, the stems would have been blanched as a vegetable. My job as head gardener is very varied not only maintaining and restoring the gardens as the Darwins would have known them, but also maintaining and enhancing these flower-rich habitats in the countryside around. This would have been Darwin's living landscape laboratory. Thank you for joining me at the beautiful house and gardens of Charles Darwin. We look forward to seeing you in the near future. If you want to know more, visit our website.